Well, this morning is uh, to carry on the theme of the, the Jewish faith, which primarily first century church was Jewish Christians. First century church was Messianic Jews. A lot of people don't understand that. I think Christian church is Gentile, but not. It started off as Messianic Jews, those people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And we today are called Messianic Gentiles. That is, Gentiles who believe in Messiah was Jesus. So this morning we've come out of the Feast of Trumps. We've come out of Rosh Hashanah. We're now in the ten days of all, the reflection and repentance before next Sunday, which is Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. So I thought it was only right to talk about something that is very important to the Jews and should be the Gentiles, and especially in this particular point in time, I'm going to be talking on Shalom, knowing the peace of God. Philippians 4, 6, 8 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, that your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Shalom, shalom alahem. is a Hebrew greeting meaning peace be upon you. And the response to that is alahem shalom. Reverse, which means unto you peace. One greets with both the body and the soul. Shalom is about deep inside you. It's not just a word you just say like, I'm sorry, which means absolutely diddly squat, really. You can say sorry, but what is sorry? It should be that you do it no more. You turn your back on it. The same as repentance. You turn your back on it, walk away, and you never do that again. Something that's deep inside you. Many religions also share this greeting, shalom. In Arabic, and Muslim, and many other language and ethnic backgrounds, they say, assalamu alaikum, I peace be upon you. Catholic and Orthodox churches say, peace be with you. It's what the bishop or the priest says during the divine services. At Mass, Catholic priests who are not bishops say, the Lord be with you. And the response by the people in the congregation is, and with your spirit or the peace of the Lord be upon you always. Similarly, peace be with you in Anglican, Episcopal, some Presbyterian and Reformed churches with the response, and also with you. Most know the Hebrew word shalom is understood around the world to mean peace. However, peace is only a small part of the meaning. Shalom is used both to greet people, to bid them farewell, and it means much more than peace hello, or goodbye. Hebrew words go beyond speaking or spoken the word. They paint pictures. And it's in these pictures that things become beautiful and more understanding and more deep. They're, they convey feeling, intent, 
emotions, all in the Hebrew word. Luke 24, 36 says, and as they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Shalom. And into whatsoever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. Luke 10, 5. John 20, 21 says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Of course, there's only one way to be true shalom, and that is in the word of Yahweh, God, Amashavach, Messiah. Many search for fulfillment and happiness and contentment in material things in life, like money, sex, entertainment, but you know, all these only serve Satan's ferocious appetite. He loves you, Satan. He loves you with all his heart. When it's all about money, sexual lust, entertain anything to stop you from thinking of Jesus Messiah. But those things do not fill that little hole in the chasm of your soul. Only God can do that. There's a space here. There's a voidness. There's an emptiness. And people try to fill it with all sorts of things. Addictions, drugs. But nothing fills it. Which is why when you go to the addiction clinics, you usually find the Ten Commandments on the wall. You find scriptures on the wall because they understand that to replace something of addiction has to be stronger than the addiction in the first place. It's filled with the love of Christ. That love inside that respects who you are inside. That feeling to know who you are. Not what you think you are or what other people want you to be, but who God wants you to be. And it's that filling of that, that voidness in that chasm that can only be filled with the shalom, the peace of God, which gives you total peace and serenity within yourselves. Those things only serve to distract and prevent that Satan likes you to do. Finding true peace, the shalom that can only come from him, listen, who created and put all things into place in the universe. Out of the voidness, out of the darkness, he created the waters. He created the firmament. He brought all things together in order to what you see today. Not just the earth you walk on, or the ground you walk on, but the air, the sunlight, the birds, the animals, nature, everything you see, feel, hear, emotions, have all been created for you. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Shalom. Luke 2, 8, 13. I'm doing this from the Aramaic English New Testament, okay, the A-E-N-T. At this time, shepherds were there in the region, and they were lodging and keeping watch there at night over their flocks. And behold, a messenger of Elohim came to them, and the glory of Master Yahweh shone upon them. And they feared with great fear, and the messenger said to them, Do not have fear, for behold, 
I announce hope to you, a great joy which will be to the whole world. For today is born to you in the city David, the Savior who is Master Yahweh, God. And the Mashi, or Mashat, Messiah. And this is a sign to you, and you will find an infant who is wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And at that instant, the great host of heaven appeared with the messenger, glorifying Elohim, and saying, Glory to Elohim in the highest, and on earth, peace and good hope to who? The sons of men. You, every single one of you. This is one of the most powerful statements about God and his Messiahship in the entire Aramaic New Testament. God is the real Messiah who chose the vessel, the body, Yeshua, Jesus, the man. However, with Jesus, the human man, it meets the one divine nature of God, also known as Rosh Hakadish, the Holy Spirit. That spirit, that same spirit is breathed into Adam, who from our point of view looked just like a mannequin. But then when he, God breathed the Holy Spirit, his spirit inside of Adam, he became what? A living soul. It's a literal meaning of fulfillment of God dwelling inside Messiah, according to the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the prophet writings and prophecy, Isaiah 53, 1 and Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for only child. And they will grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The divine and the human nature exist separately in the man, Yeshua, side by side. Human, Divine, God, man, spiritual, living inside one body. And remember, you are made up of a body that possesses a soul, that has a spirit because you are spirit first, that possesses a soul, that you walk this earth having a human experience inside a human body, the same as Jesus did when heaven come down to earth. In other words, shalom is a mighty blessing. Proverbs 18, 22 says, there is life or death in the power of the tongue. Therefore, someone or somewhere Whenever you employed the word shalom, you are speaking into someone's life. Your words are going into them and speaking in life inside them. And all the wonderful things about shalom and the meaning of that peace. Your words are powerful. Think about them. Think about how they affect other people when you say them. I hate you. But they don't say that, do they? I hate you. I wish you were dead. Do you really? Do you really understand what you've just said? Do you understand how that will affect that person? Not only psychologically, but physically? Ask a child who's been brought up in an abusive home, when he gets to the age of 30, what it was like in that home and how it affected him and how it will affect him to the day he dies. I forget which one it was. It was either Lenin or Stalin said, 
Give me a child until it's five or six years old and you can have him after that because I've taught him the way to grow up and who he is to be. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I'll say that again. You will be saved. That's not a comment. That's not a talking point. That is a promise. And let me tell you, God never lies. Jesus never tells an untruth. A promise is a promise. Not your promises, because you break your promises every day. This is God's promises, who's eternal. Past, present, and future. It's not for today. His promises live forever. What better good news is there than Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins so that we might become the children of God through faith alone in Christ. But for many Christians, the good news of the gospel doesn't seem to be good enough. They want more. Where are they going to get more? I do not know. I don't have a clue. But they want more. When we watch nightly news on TV, we see violence, anger, and murder. When we look at relationships, there's anxiety, drama, and bitterness. When we look at social media, we are bombarded with racial tension and hate. And there is no more racial tension and hate than what there is prevalent today. And will get worse. Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, believe you me. That's not the start of it. That's going to be the rush towards it. More bitterness, more hate. Coupled with a presidential election, I do not know what this place called America is going to look like in December and the first quarter of next year. I do not know what's going to happen. It certainly won't be the same place that I know, that I came to live 20 years ago from England. It will not be the same. So many people are missing out on the biblical call to shalom and peace. It's a full contentment within our body, soul and spirit. God wants shalom between men and women, peace between men and women, no matter what the color of their skin either. Because remember what I told you just now, you are spirit first that possesses a soul that lives inside a body covered in skin of whatever color. But that's only your vehicle, it's not who you are. It's only the vehicle you're traveling around having a little experience on earth before you go home. Do you take your vehicle home? No, it goes to the scrapyard. But your soul and your spirit stays with you forever. And that's who you are, not the color of your skin. Not being six foot six or four foot three. You're all the same size. You look all the same. You speak the same because you're all worshipping God. God wants shalom between men and women. God loves peace. The new covenant of Jesus is manifested in what? God's divine grace. You don't deserve it, by the way. You don't deserve none of that. But God loves you so much and says, I couldn't care less what you've done. My son died for you. My son washed you clean. And that's good enough for my son. That's good enough for me and I remember your sins no more. Many people in the world have trouble understanding what peace is. Listen to this. Can you handle God's peace? Can you handle it? Can you, 
Do you know what to do with it? Can you love yourself? Can you understand yourself? Strange things to say. But do you really know who you are? Do you even like yourself? I would suggest that a lot of people do not like themselves, do not like who they are, and they're trapped. They, they don't really know how to get out of it. They don't know the peace of God. They don't know what it's like to be at peace with themselves. Can you honestly say that you know what it's like to be peace at yourself? Are you angry with yourself? Are you disappointed with yourself? Do you have the right job? Do you earn the right amount of money? Have you got the same car as your neighbor? Can you be happy with that? Can you love your neighbor like you love? Or can you love your neighbor the, the way that you're supposed to love yourself? You might say you love your neighbor, but do you love yourself like you love your neighbor? Do you know the peace of God? Do you know the shalom that he has for you? The contentment and harmony? Think about it. They've never experienced a feeling of being trouble-free and deeply loved in a fast-paced world. Where do we as Christians find that kind of peace, you say? That is not just absence of trouble, but at peace deep within your body and your soul and your spirit. From your head to your... From the, well, what can I say? From the top of your head to the tip of your toes, your whole being of who you are can only be through Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ on the night before he died in agony, remember? On the cross, he still took time to comfort his disciples with a message of peace. John 14, 25, 27 says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all that I have said to you. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, who are they all pointed to? You. Father loves you. Jesus walked this earth with you. And the Holy Spirit wants to be with you all the time. I leave you with my peace I give to you. I do not forgive to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. We come into this world fighting against God because why? We are part of the rebellion. A bit like Star Wars, the rebellion. May the force be with you. Because it all started with Adam and Eve. The Bible says, For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? In Romans 5.10. The covenant of peace declares that we can now be at peace with who God, who wants to be or have the anger of God against them. Jesus says, I give you peace, and then says, do not let your heart be troubled. We receive the peace he gives us, but we also need to apply that peace where? In here. And what are we supposed to do? Live it. Don't just speak it. Don't just say, I have it. But live that peace. Walk that peace. God originally made a world that was peaceful, where animals, man, nature, all lived in harmony with each other in the Garden of Eden. Jesus came back to place that original place, that peace, where to back into the hearts and souls of you. Take out that anger. <coughs> Take out that jealousy, that pride. Peace is not just free and friendly towards someone, 
but spiritually loving them. There is no other way. If you have no Jesus, and you have no peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, The one who brings the peace that passeth all understanding. But when God brings his peace, it provides a protection from everything that is in this natural world. You have God. You have peace. You walk upright. There's no fear. There's no animosity. There's no jealousy. You walk in Jesus' shoes and you walk upright, steadfast. And people say, who is that walking down the street? What's different about them? And I'll tell you what's different about them. They look straight forward. The next time you're walking down the road or walking in a supermarket or anywhere, how many of you are looking straight ahead or left and right? One, you'll be looking at the ground as you're walking. Two, you won't look at someone's eyes. You'll look away. Anything will look at their eyes. As a Christian, you are proud of who you are. You are proud of yourself. Not pride, proud. And you look straight forward. You look at people with the eyes of love, not with the eyes of jealousy or pride. In the armor of God in Ephesians 6, the peace is not worn over the heart, nor the covering the head, but peace is worn on the feet. You take it with you. It means we have the peace of God with us wherever we go. And it's the only thing that can stand against doubt and confusion. Colossians says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. I'm going to finish with a couple of things. Peace cannot be determined by your own psychologically based viewpoints. You can't decide it. Or selfish physical needs but on our spiritual trust in God through the Holy Spirit, which is all bound together in unity for the whole of creation, not just you, but everything. Adam and Eve could not follow the simple rules that they were given, so they were banished. The cynic would say, of course, that I've tried to make things right and make things happen. I've worked and I've hoped, but everyone eventually disappoints me. Jesus will never disappoint you. God the Father will never disappoint you. The Holy Spirit will not lead you into disappointment. You will. You will even look for it. You will even want to see it and hear it and find it. Because it's in your nature to do that. Because you're not happy within. So there must be a reason for it. And you look for it outside. Instead of looking inside to who you really are. You say, I should hope in God. But it's like asking me to trust in the tough fairy. How can I believe in a supernatural being? Let's be honest. How can I believe in a supernatural be being? It's like trying to believe in that tough fairy that leaves sixpence. Oh, sorry, I don't know what it is over here. It's probably America, they've got tons of money. That leaves a dollar bill underneath your pillow. Five, I got five. Five, five dollars. Oh my goodness me, inflation's rampant over here. But there was a man called Rabbi Robert Kahn from Houston in Texas. I think he said once, this, is, this lack of trust in an almighty God is reflective in a story about a nine-year-old boy returning from a Hebrew school who tells his mother about 
the day's lesson he learnt today. Well, he said, the rabbi told how God sent Moses behind the enemy lines to rescue the Israelites from the Egyptians. When they came to the Red Sea, Moses called for the engineers to build a pontoon bridge. And after they had all crossed, they looked back and saw the Egyptian tanks come in. Quick as a flash, Moses radioed to headquarters on his walkie-talkie to send in the bombers to destroy the bridge. And that's how he saved the Israelite nation. But his mother was astounded. She said, David, is that really what happened? Is that really what the rabbi told you? Well, David said, well, not exactly, Mom. But if I told you it his way, you would have never believed it. <laughs> the story's humorous because it's all too true. When things are bigger than our own life experience, we translate God's acts by limited understanding because we don't have God's understanding. We try and do it with our understanding, which isn't much really. And when we do that, we diminish the value or who God is because we can't go to his level. We have to bring God down to our level, which diminishes all his authority. Which means to say, how can he be supernatural if he's like me? Well, you're not like him. And that's the reason why, because you can't put yourself in his shoes because he is a creator and you are the creation. You can't be the creator. You are what he made you. We diminish the possibility of peace in our own lives. We diminish the one who has power to give it to us. We are not in a position to obtain peace ourselves, the wholeness and completeness. So the prophet Isaiah wrote, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts you. Trust is in the Lord forever for the Lord is the rock eternal the eternal rock. That's in 26, 3, 4. If you don't know Yeshua, Jesus, as HaMashagat, the anointed one, now is your time to seek him, to ask him, reveal himself. The Messiah doesn't follow religion, so neither should you. We have nothing to lose but everything to gain. I'm going to put up more specific. What have you got to lose if you seek God? Probably a few friends. Probably a different outlook on life. Probably you'll understand a bit more without the intoxication of liquor inside you. Perhaps you'll not make a fool in the bar when you're drunk or at a party. Are these things worth holding on to? Or is there things better in this world, better for you, better for life? Is there things that you should want to achieve but can't have them the way that you're running your own life at the moment? But with God's help, everything is possible. Scripture tells you that. Everything is possible. Ask and it will be given. Trust and he will obey. Obey and he will trust. I'm going to finish with a blessing. It's the Hebraic version of the Aaronic blessing. In number 6, 24. To 26. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his face upon you 
and give you shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Sar Shalom, which means Jesus Messiah, Anointed One, and the Prince of Peace. Amen.